Hey folks, it's Chris. Welcome back to another episode of Comic Tropes. And you know what? Today I'm going to be reviewing a comic that I absolutely love. So this silly background doesn't really make sense. Let's make a change here. Yeah, much better. Alright, so what comic do I have that I consider such an underrated gem? It's little something called Strike Force Moratori. It began publishing in 1986 through Marvel Comics, and it was not connected in any way to their superhero titles. It's more or less a creator-owned book, which they did a few of at that point in time. I say more or less because the right situation, it isn't the most clear thing in the world. I think if it was clearly owned by either the creators or Marvel, one of them would have adapted it into television or movies by now, because it's a killer concept. Essentially, the overarching idea of this whole comic is that aliens have attacked Earth, uh, Earth needs to fight back, and they discover a way to create superheroes. But it's a far from perfect solution. Uh, first of all, only less than 5% of the entire world population is genetically compatible with this process. So it's a very small pool of people that can potentially undergo this transformation. Second, if you undergo the moratory process and you get superpowers, you're definitely going to die within a year. Your body eventually just can't maintain this second metabolism that they lay over you. And you burn up. You'll explode or melt or, or something like that. You just cannot control it. And while I say a year, it could be as little as a week. So this comic featured a constantly evolving and changing cast. Because they could die on a mission, but they'd also eventually just die through the process of becoming superhuman. So it was just this fascinating look at the interpersonal dynamics of people that knew they were going to die, and they just hoped that they could die in battle, serving humankind. What a fascinating idea. Gotta give a lot of credit to the creators. Peter B. Gillis was the writer, Brent Anderson was the artist. Uh, Peter Gillis has not done a ton of other stuff in comics. He did lots of fill-in issues for Marvel, and then he came up with this killer concept. Then Brent Anderson, well, he's pretty known uh, in the industry for uh, working on Astro City with Kurt Busiek. But this was one of his first projects. He's very much in the Neil Adams school of dynamic realism. Kind of like, uh, you know, this stuff. This is Neil Adams. A little bit of that kind of style. Uh, and so the two of them worked together on the first 20 issues of this comic, and it only lasted 30-some issues total. Uh, it, it got a new creative team, and it fizzled out. So, you know, it has a conclusion. It's good. But when you're reading it, just sort of know that it doesn't necessarily build to a conclusion that the creators intended. Uh, but the first 20 issues or so are fantastic world building, amazingly dynamic characters. Before I waste any more time, let's just jump into the issue, see what kind of tropes it might have used, and see why I like it so much. As the issue begins, Team Leader Harold is recording his thoughts on nature and its relationship with mankind into a recorder. And he's waxing poetic, he's talking about how uh, they currently live in a base underneath the mountains, and it's an interesting contrast to him. The reason Harold is doing this is because before he found out that he was genetically compatible with becoming one of these superhumans, uh, he wanted to be a writer. So this is sort of like if George McFly became a superhuman. One of my favorite quotes by Harold is whether there's a good reason to die. He wrote, I expect I'll have a few adventures, but adventure is not a good reason to die. Just as hate is not a good reason to die. Not even love is a good reason to die. Not even life. What is a good reason to die? I really don't know, but I think I'll find out soon. It's not the bloodiest or goriest comic book, but it tackles some pretty serious issues. Moving on, we move inside the headquarters that the Strike Force is based out of, and two of the characters are talking to each other. One says, Pretty impressive, huh, Jolene? Strike Force Moratory Central. And all for us. She replies, it's a little humbling, Robert. 
all the characters call each other by their first name or their code name at least once when they first meet them, it's really done for us, the audience, because it was a large cast and an ever-evolving cast. It's not the most natural thing, but I also don't know how you'd necessarily get around it, bringing viewers up to speed. Everybody loves to say each other's name just that first time. After that, you know, it's buddy or pal or hey you. A third team member, Aileen, runs up and wants to show them something, and she's in such a hurry, she simply jumps a whole story onto the ground. She says, Come on, we won't break. You've got super strength now, and other powers besides. Forget the stairs. The moratory process was a two-step process. Uh, first, they would enhance people to give them uh, extra strength and durability. That was basically so that they could then accept the full moratory process, which would give them powers at random. They didn't know what they would get. Uh, sometimes somebody unfortunately got something as useless as being able to make flowers grow. Uh, not going to be very helpful out there in the field. So unfortunately they just gave up a year of their life and they don't get to even necessarily serve their world. Uh, but in this case, uh, everybody at least has some measure of super strength. Uh, it all goes to an interesting bit of world building. They don't just have superpowers. No, they had to sort of be built up to accept these temporary superpowers. Also, in the issue, you can see this big tall guy, Robert, is constantly eating these little crackers. That's because his superpower made him slowly grow bigger and stronger throughout his lifespan, and he needed extra fuel. So it was just this little weird quirk of world building. He was constantly eating these special protein bars. Robert and Jolene eventually decide they will also jump down that one story, and Robert shouts out, Okay, Marathon and Adept, coming down! As much as I love the comic, I have to admit that the code names left a little something to be desired. Maybe it was the fact that these characters were designed to be disposable, so they didn't need iconic code names, but none of them were very exciting. They were all pretty bland, just sort of vaguely descriptive. There were names like Brava, Backhand, Scaredy Cat, Scatterbrain, Viking. They just felt sort of generic, but maybe that was intentional. The reason Aileen was so excited was she found out that there's an actual studio there at the base where they will be interviewed for all sorts of newsreels. The celebrity of these characters was a big element of who they were. This will remind you of something like Hunger Games, actually. These heroes were constantly put on TV. They had movies and other comic books and things like that based on them. And it was because these were people that were donating their lives to help protect Earth. So they became more of a propaganda tool than anything else. Uh, and, you know, they knew it, but they were treated as celebrities for whatever time they had remaining. One of the key characters of the book, the Commander, stops by and tells them that, yeah, this is what you get when you become a Strike Force member. You get celebrity, but you also get, you know, this really nice base with big rooms and a sauna and masseuses and all sorts of great things. From there, the trio of heroes stop by Dr. Tulema who is helping a fourth member of the team, Radian. Dr. Tulema has helped develop the moratory process, and he explains to Radian that he can emit anything from radio waves to low gamma radiation and in tremendous pulses. Dr. Tulema is one of the creators of the moratory process and works closely with the team to help them uh, focus their powers in new and more efficient ways. He's helping Radian develop a way that he can use his various radiation powers uh, in a more focused, enhanced way. Now, Dr. Tulema and the Commander are the closest thing we get to permanent cast members. Uh, they outlive a lot of the superheroes that come and go throughout the title. Uh, they're really interesting characters. You see the weight that's on them as they know that these team members that they're helping guide and mold and create are not going to live forever. They're going to they're move on at some point, uh, and that's a nice way of saying it. 
having Dr. Tulema and the Commander as the ongoing characters while the superheroes die, it's essentially equivalent to what if James Bond died in every single movie, but Q and M stayed along. In fact, one of the team members asks Dr. Tulema if he'll come to the housewarming party that they're about to have, and Dr. Tulema says he can't. He says, sorry, I've got to get back to New Haven and begin developing your replacements. There was always a next wave of characters ready to come. Sometimes they came in ones and twos, and sometimes it was an entirely new team. Uh, but it's pretty morbid stuff. We cut to another part of the base where team leader Harold is talking with his teammate Lorna, and they're suddenly interrupted by news that Paris is under attack by the aliens, who are also known as the Horde. They want our baguettes! Harold has the team start to suit up for battle, but the commander comes in and shuts it all down. Harold argues, not again, don't waste yourselves, you're too important, backwash, we don't have time, we're giving up our lives to fight the aliens, why won't you let us? And the commander explains, because you'd never get there in time. Apparently it's a small attack force and they don't feel that the team could get there in time to really do anything significant, but the team themselves are always eager to get into battle, no matter what their personality was before this, because they know they're living on borrowed time, and they want to make this time count. So they're always eager to go into battle. I think a lot of them would prefer to die in battle than to suddenly, randomly explode back at home, for instance. Harold records more thoughts for a book when he's interrupted by Aileen. She comes in with a report on the Paris attack. The Horde took people's heads. Not their whole bodies, they just attacked civilians and took their heads. That's one way to get a head in life. The Horde was absolutely vicious. Vicious and actually kind of dumb. Uh, there's an interesting reason behind that. First of all, they would do horrible things. They would kidnap civilians, take them up into low Earth orbit, and drop them into the atmosphere so that people below could see them burning up on re-entry, just to terrify us. They basically were an alien civilization who was met by interstellar travelers from another alien race that was more benevolent. But these people were savage, and they attacked this alien race and stole their starships and their weaponry and started going planet to planet raiding them. Uh, that's why they haven't conquered Earth. They really don't n know how to, per se. They just constantly stay in orbit and raid us for resources. These guys were realistic Klingons. We briefly cut to some Horde aliens that are conducting experiments on people's heads. Before cutting back to Harold and Robert, who are simply going on a hike in the wilderness and trying to enjoy some of nature's beauty. Harold asks Robert if he's coming on as too pushy, but Robert says, Harold, you're a leader. You see something that needs to be done, and you just do it. You don't think about it. You don't worry about your own safety. The raid this morning, and your run-in with the commanders got you thinking and second-guessing yourself too much. Me? I joined the moratorium because I felt like I'd let everybody down. Bad reason. I was just as mousy as my dad was, but I wasn't a brilliant scientist to compensate. I felt I had to do more. We'd frequently learn about the motivations of different characters for why they wanted to go through this process. And everybody was a little bit unique. It was nice. We really got to know these characters, which meant when we lost them, it actually meant something. That night, the team is awoken from their sleep, and they finally got an actual mission. A city in the Soviet Union is being attacked. So it's probably worth explaining that when the Horde attacked, all of the Earth's governments united into one world government. And uh, it was an interesting idea because you got to remember, this was the height of the Cold War. So the idea of, you know, the U.S. and Russia being complete allies, that was fairly progressive and sci-fi at the time. Uh, it's an interesting idea. If humanity was facing an external threat, is that something that would unite us? Uh, it's both believable and kind of depressing. As the characters fly in their supersonic jet over to Russia, Harold's hand begins to glow, and he realizes that he could explode at any second. 
The strike force lands in the Soviet Union and begins fighting horde forces who are bolstered by some sort of robots. Lorna picks up one of the robots to smash it and realizes something horrific. Inside those robots are the human heads. The Horde has created absolute abominations. Not Flat Earth truthers, no, they've turned humanity into robotic slaves. The regular soldiers realize that the human heads inside the robots are screaming in constant pain. Harold is briefly overcome by the pure horror and overwhelmed by Horde forces, but then they start to melt. It turns out that Lorna and Radian have teamed up, her plasma blast is propelled by his radiation, and it caused several of the Horde to melt, freeing Harold. From there we cut to Jeline, also known as Adept, and she has a very unique power. If she can take her time, she can sense how something, anything really, works, and figure out the cause and the solution to pretty much any problem. In this particular instance, Adept is trying to figure out what's controlling these robotic human slaves. But why did she never think to use her powers on herself? What causes people to truly explode and reject the powers? She never thought to do that. Oh, it feels like a missed opportunity to at least have her explore that idea. The team continues to cooperate and use their powers in tandem, which is just good writing. And ultimately, they find the field horde commander who has a device that's controlling the robotic humans. The strike force sends the horde retreating, and then they crush the device, which basically kills the robotic human slaves. And then the team celebrates as though that's a huge victory. And to them, I suppose that is a victory, but it's a pretty dark one. They won by killing the remaining human heads. Uh, they never really flat-out defeat the Horde. Uh, they're overwhelmed by the Horde forces. Even though these guys are powerful, it's a small team. They can only be in so many places at once. So, they never really realize themselves that they're primarily a tool, a propaganda tool. Uh, something to, to bolster humanity and give us hope in this seemingly unwinnable war. Uh, it was a really interesting idea, uh, obviously dark, but there were moments of victory. There were absolutely moments of victory. Like I say, the first 20 issues or so were by one creative team, and then a new creative team, uh, or at least a new writer, uh, no, writer and artist, yeah, a new writer and artist took uh, on the role. It was actually Mark Bagley's first professional artwork. He's now very well known for his runs on Spider-Man but he got his start doing several issues of Strike Force Moratory. I would say it doesn't ultimately have a satisfying conclusion. It has a conclusion, but it starts to bring in new elements, and I don't think that those new elements were needed. I think that they had a rock-solid foundation right from the get-go. Aliens are attacking Earth, we have a way to create superheroes, but they're only temporary superheroes. There's a huge price to be paid. And I think it analyzes some really deep themes. The idea that death comes for us all, that we can't really escape it. Uh, the idea of teamwork and our reasons for finding something bigger than just ourselves. What would motivate people to help humanity, to be sort of selfless? That's a fascinating idea to explore. What makes somebody selfless? So anyway, I love this book. I think that it's fairly underrated. I don't think everybody knows about it. You can now get these stories uh, pretty easily in trade paperback. A few years ago, Marvel finally started releasing the issues in trade paperbacks. So those are available at your comic book store, at Amazon, etc. And I definitely recommend it. I think it's a fascinating read. All right, coming up next week is something completely different. But until then, keep reading comics.